Yeah, I'm not quite sure how to move her. Um, <laughs> I'm getting some assistance from John. <laughs> okay, that's totally fine. She can hear and- um, I'll keep her nice. unmuted right now um, okay. until I can get her moved over. Okay, perfect. Um, welcome to the Plant Salt Lake City Planning Commission meeting for December 15th, 2021. We do have um, a quorum and all of our uh, uh, commissioners present that indicated they would be. So we'll go ahead and start this meeting. Uh, last week, I read the attention notice, so I don't need to do that again. Um, we will dive right into the report of the chair. I don't have anything other than I want to say thank you to everyone who um, made this uh, extra meeting um, a priority on your schedule. Um, I appreciate that. It'll be our last meeting for 2021, so we'll get a little bit of a break. And uh, the uh, Vice Chair Maureen, do you have a report? I have nothing. Thank you. Okay. Um, a report of the director, who tonight is Kelsey. Good evening. I have a couple things to report. Um, <clears throat> first being the uh, Bueno Avenue rezone was approved by city council last night um, with a legislative intent associated with that uh, approval. And then I would like to introduce David Shupik. He is the admin admin and training. He'll be taking over the meeting in the next hour from Aubrey. And we do have a recruitment campaign for planning commissioners uh, for the D1 and D2 districts. And Michaela is working with the mayor's office on recruiting planning commissioners. And um, anyone listening that is interested in applying, you can apply on the mayor's boards and commission page online. And that's all I have, Commissioner Barry. Okay, um, we will move on. We do not have minutes um, for last week's meeting. That's a pretty quick turnaround. So we will pick up those um, approval on those when we reconvene in January. So with that said, we can um, just begin the public hearings. Our first item on the agenda is a conditional use ADU at approximately 362 East Sherman Avenue. It's case number PLN PCM 2021-00663. And the planner is Michael. Michael, is this your first meeting with the commission? Michael, if you're speaking, we cannot hear you. Can I know? It's faint. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little better. <laughs> I just sit as close to the computer as, as I can. Um, so to answer your question, yes, this is my, my first meeting. So hello. Welcome to um, presenting um, duties at the Planning Commission. Uh, go ahead and start your presentation. Okay. okay, so this request is for a new detached ADU to be located in the rear yard of the property at 362 East Sherman Avenue. The subject property is zoned R15000 single family residential, and is also in the Liberty Wells National Historic District. Staff is recommending that the commission approve the request. Michael, if you're, oh, there we go. We weren't seeing any new page, but it's going now. Um, the proposed ADU would be constructed in the Southeast corner of the rear yard. The applicant is also proposing to build a separate detached garage the garage is not subject to conditional use approval. Um, the ADU would be approximately 465 square feet. The plan incorporates a storage loft area that is designed to be non-habitable and therefore does not count towards the gross floor area. The height of the ADU structure would be 17 feet, shorter than the height of the principal dwelling, which is 18 feet, six inches. 
the proposed structure meets all lot and bulk regulations in the ADU ordinance. The Transportation Division has confirmed that the proposal will meet parking requirements, although not in the way that is presented on the plans, uh, which show three off-street parking stalls. The parking ordinance requires two off-street stalls for the single-family dwelling, and the ADU ordinance requires one off-street stall be provided for the ADU. As proposed, the space provided for off-street parking would only meet code requirements for two off-street stalls. However, the ADU ordinance also permits the parking requirement for the ADU to be waived if there is legally located on-street parking available along the street frontage of the property, or if the subject property is located within one quarter mile of a transit stop. As noted by the Transportation Division in their review, this property has both of those characteristics. The applicant is proposing several windows that would face side and rear property lines and be located within 10 feet of those property lines. Code requires that these windows use obscured glazing, except for the clear story windows proposed on the south facade. Here's a floor plan and drawings that show the layout of the proposed ADU, including the loft storage space. And these elevation drawings show the four sides of the ADU on the first two rows and the four sides of the proposed garage on the bottom row. Once again, the garage is not subject to conditional use approval, but the drawings are provided for reference. The ADU is proposed to be built in the southeast corner of the rear yard, where there is currently a small shed and garden, both of which will be removed. The six foot tall fence that currently stands around the perimeter of the rear yard will remain. Staff has not received any comments from the public uh, regarding this proposal. Notice was sent to the Liberty Wells and Central City Community Councils and neither council provided feedback. Um, staff recommends that the commission approve the conditional use for an accessory dwelling unit. The proposal meets all applicable standards discussed in the staff report. That concludes my presentation, and I am happy to take questions at this time. All right, commissioners, any questions for staff at this moment? Madam Chair, I'd just like to note that actually we did receive a letter uh, commenting, and it is in our packet. So, yeah, that's correct. It's in our Dropbox from Bill Davis. Anybody else? Okay, is the applicant here? I believe yes. so. George Craig, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. George, did you have a formal presentation that you needed to share on your screen for? I do not. I just have a couple words to share. Okay, then by all means, go ahead. Please uh, state your name so it's pronounced correctly for the record, and go ahead. Hi, everybody. This is George Gregar, and really just want to say thanks for taking the time to review and hopefully approve uh, our plans. Um, it's been a exciting and thorough process. So I appreciate um, the stipulations that you all put forth or the city puts forth um, being a resident neighborhood. I think it's important that we take those things into consideration to make sure that we keep the character and uh, neighborhoodliness um, intact. I have been in this neighborhood now for um, about seven years and Part of this plan is, you know, planting deeper roots in the neighborhood and hoping to stay for a long time. I do have uh, the intent of renting that out. And I think um, knowing our city population um, and some of the housing shortages that we have, I hope that can help alleviate that. Long term, I also have aging parents and I do. Uh, I would love to be able to be in this house long enough where I could support my family um, if they get to the point where something like this could be. Hopeful for them as they transition in their older age, but that's probably a ways away as well. So really just want to say thanks and looking forward to the rest of the process. All right. Thank you, George. Commissioners, any questions for the applicant at this time? Okay, George, hang tight. We're going to open the public hearing and if we have anything else, we'll come back to you after that. Um, but right now we will open the public hearing. Kelsey, um, are there any hands raised? If you are a member of the public and wish to speak on this, you need to click the hand in the lower right-hand corner that lets us know you wish to speak. 
At this time, I do not see any hands. John, are there any additional emails sent to uh, the email address? We do not have any emails. Okay, with that, I will close the public comment period for this and bring it back to the commission, um, seeing that we had no questions before. If you have something now, go ahead. Otherwise, I'd entertain a motion. I'd like to make a motion. Thank you, Andres. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, based on the findings listed in the staff report, the information presented and input received during the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission approve the conditional use request, uh, PLN PCM 2021-00663, as proposed. I'll second that. Okay, I have a motion from Andreas and a second from Mike. We'll go ahead and take a vote. Maureen. Yes. yes. Thank you. Amy. Yes. Mike. Yes. Andra? Yes. John? Yes. Andreas? I'll vote yes. And Brenda? Yes. All right, that motion passes unanimously. Congratulations, Mr. Gregor. Good luck on your build. Um, we will now move on to our second agenda item, which is a street vacation at approximately 601 South 900 East. That's case number PLN PCM 2021-00614. The planner on this tonight is Aaron. Uh, good evening. Thank you. Um, this is a request to uh, for a partial street vacation at the property located approximately 601 South 900 East. Um, the applicant is requesting this street vacation uh, because there is a fence that sits within the public right of way. And this was provided as an option by a real estate services division. Um, staff is recommending a positive recommend, recommendation, recommend, recommending that the planning commission recommend a positive recommendation to the city council. Um, here is a photo of the property in question. As you can see, there's a fence there in the front yard. Some other views to help get some context. This is look to the left is looking to the south, and you see the fence there. Um, to the right is looking to the north along 900 East. And same thing here, but looking to the east uh, along 600 South. And the picture on the right is looking to the west. This issue arose because the applicant submitted a fence permit to repair the that wood fence that is in disrepair and found that the fence actually sits in the public right of way and was given a violation letter by the civil civil enforcement. Um, and they were provided a few options in order to rectify the issue. Um, they decided to pursue this street vacation request. Street vacation requests are decided by the city council. They're not beholden to any single standard, but they did adopt a policy in 1999, and those standards are in the staff report along with my analysis. And we're recommending approval. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you, Aaron. Um, commissioners, do you have any questions for Aaron at this time? I just have one. Does the seismic run that full length of uh, 600 South? How far down does it go? It is the entire I'm really looking at this property, but I'm wondering how far down it goes. <laughs> yeah, that is something that was brought up by a, a nearby resident and it appears to be a common problem. And civil enforcement really enforces these on a case by case basis um, as things come up, whether by complaint or you know through a permit process. So if there are other property owners with the same issue, um, recommendation is to reach out to real estate services um, mm -hmm. to see what their options are. I'm just wondering, does it go down the full length of this block to 10th? Um, without an official survey, it's hard to say. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions, commissioners? All right. Is the applicant here? Oh, just, did I hear somebody pipe up? Yes, the applicant's here. 
Um, and that would be Justin Matkin. Correct. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Justin, do yeah. you need screen sharing privileges? No, but if you could just maybe, Aaron, if you could just keep that on the. Uh, okay. That's, that same photo there. Yes, yeah, so um, thank you very much, Justin Matkin, on behalf of uh, Michael and Amy Kennedy, who are the property owners. I'm an attorney at the law firm of Pro Brown, Gian Loveless, and have been asked to uh, just say a few words this evening. So thank you very much for hearing this. Um, th this is kind of an unusual, I don't know if it's unusual, but th the Kennedys believed until um, fairly recently that they actually owned the property um, on their side of the fence uh, when they, um, obviously tried to fix the wood fence that was falling down, received notice that the right of way is actually inside of inside of their fence by five or six feet um, and received a notice of violation. And um, as Aaron said, a few options to remedy the situation. Uh, the, the right of way here on six South is about uh, 132 feet wide and on nine South about 130. 35 feet wide. So it's a very large right of way um, mm. that that is occupied by very ample park strips, some beautiful um, historic uh, trees that you'll see there. The, what would normally be considered private, well, what we thought was private property, um, but turned out to be part of the public right of way. Um, you actually actually notice on those lot lines where it says 601 and 609, um, you can see that the boundaries actually shifted over on all of these residences about six feet. So at some point in the in the long ago past, there was probably some type of surveying error by the original subdivision that created this problem and is just being discovered now. In any event. Um, uh, the, the solution here is for uh, the Kennedys to purchase um, this, these small strips, which I said are about five, five feet wide on the other side of the, uh, on the property side of the sidewalk. And so the city will be receiving a uh, fair value uh, for that land purchase. We'll need to go through an appraisal process and, and determine that the value, but the city will be receiving a check for the value of that property from um, the Kennedys, um, assuming that this goes through with positive recommendation and also uh, approved by the city council, which is a, again, a, a, a partial um, street vacation. The, the issue with, with respect to the other owners kind of um, up and down the street, it only becomes an issue really when uh, there's a fence that, that encumbers part of the right of way. In this situation, because we're on the corner, there is a fence. But if you go down farther on either side, it's kind of a case by case basis, but many of those yards are just front yards without fences. And so there's not a, there's not a clear property line or, or what was believed to be a property line distinction between those. And so even though it may be an issue that continues down the street, um, it's a particular concern on this property because it's a corner property and because there's existing fences that have been there for a long time that, that create this conflict. So. Happy to address any questions you have, uh, but thank you for your time. All right, thank you. Um, and commissioners, any question for the applicant? Um, how long, I guess I'm confused about how this problem arises and I, I'm sympathetic to the public comment we received about, you know, the other property owners affected. Um, if the city, I, how long, I guess, Justin, how long is the statute of um, adverse possession in the state of Utah? Like how, if the city was not maintaining this property, you know, is because it was public, does that make adverse possession not a feasible option for the landowners? Correct. I think that so, question should be going to staff though. Let's let Aaron weigh in on that. Yeah. That's, that's correct. Um, I mean, Justin's an attorney, but I am staff. And uh, yeah, adverse possession does not apply to um, city property, public property. In the, at least in this specific case, adverse possession does not apply. That, that's correct. So adverse possession doesn't apply against the city or the state or the county. You can't adverse, adly, adversely possess property that's owned by the government. Is that true in all states or only in the state of Utah? 
Well, this is this is Paul. Um, I'd Paul. be happy to confirm that for some reason my camera won't turn on. Um, that is correct, and that is that is a principle that is true uh, in in all states, is my understanding. Thank you. So essentially, the only way that we can remedy this situation is through a is through a sale and a purchase. But first, the city, in order to accomplish that, the first the city has to vacate this portion of the public right away. Okay, thank you for that question, Andrew. Anybody else? Okay, Justin, we'll just have you hold tight as we go through the public comment period. Um, we'll open that now. Kelsey, do we have any hands raised of members of the public who wish to speak? We do not have any hands raised at this time. And John, any emails? No emails received. Okay. With that, I will close the public comment period and bring it back to the commissioners for a discussion, further questions, or a motion. I'd like to make a motion. motion. <laughs> I heard Mike first. Go ahead, Mike. <laughs> okay. Based on the information in the staff report, public testimony and discussion by the Planning Commission, I move that the Planning Commission forwards a positive recommendation to the City Council to approve PLN PCM 2021-00614 Street Vacation at 601 South 900 East. I'll second. All right, thank you, Maureen. I have a motion from Mike and a second from Maureen. Let's go ahead and take a vote. Andra? Yes. John? Yes. Maureen? Yes. Brenda? Yes. Uh, Andreas? I will vote yes. Mike? Yes. And Amy? Yes. Okay, that motion passes unanimously. Uh, congratulations, Kennedys. You are now uh, moving on to the City Council. Um, we will go on to our next agenda item, which is the Barola plan development at approximately 442 South Post Street. That is case number PLN PCM 2020-00464. The planner tonight on this is Nan. Nan, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. Yeah, it looks like she is muted. Let me see. Ah, oh, there you go. Okay, Dan, you're unmuted. Okay, I will start again. <laughs> Thank you, um, uh, Commissioner. Uh, so Salt Lake City has received a request for a plan development for um, from the property owners, Jesus and Amalia Barilla. The plan development is to allow for modifications to the zoning district for the creation of a subdivision. The site is presently being used as a single family residential house in the R15000 uh, zoning district. The site is considered a legal non-complying lot as the site exceeds the maximum lot size in the R R15000 district. The modifications uh, requested include a reduction of lot size uh, reduction in lot width, a reduction in side yard setbacks, and a great, greater percentage of building coverage than what's presently allowed. So during staff's review, um, we have found that the Barella plan development meets the um, plan development standards of review and the R15000 zoning district standards of review. This includes the minimum plan development size, uh, the plan development master plan compatibility objective, as well as the front yard setback, the rear yard setback, the maximum lot size and maximum building height um, standards. It was also found that the Barilla subdivision meets the West Side Master Plan in Plan Salt Lake, both the neighborhood, uh, neighborhood wide and citywide plans. The four requested modifications um, through the plan development process are reducing the lot size, the lot width, and side yard setbacks, as well as increasing the allowed building coverage. 
In the R1 5000 district, the minimum lot size is, is 5000 square feet. The project includes a lot size of approximately uh, 5,700 square feet and 4,800 square feet with a combined subdivision square footage of 10,500 square feet. The request would also reduce the minimum lot width of 50 feet. The proposed is approximately 34 feet and 40 feet of frontage. Because this lot is part of an older subdivision, narrower lots and smaller lots are common in the neighborhood, um, as you can see on the uh, slide on your screen. Um, and it's a result of the neighborhood being fully developed before this area was zoned R1-5000 um, around 1995. In the R1-5000 district, the minimum side yard setbacks are 4 feet and 10 feet from the side property lines. The Borella subdivision would have a reduced setback on the side yards. Uh, reduced side yard setbacks are again common in this neighborhood. Um, in the immediate area of the subject site, I was only able to find um, the house across the street is meeting the minimum side yard setbacks. Um, all other houses surrounding the project site have reduced side yard setbacks. Um, this includes the property to the south of the proposed subdivision. Um, the property to the south has an approximately two foot um, side yard setback. The final modification requested um, is building coverage. The requested building coverage is 50% of the lot, uh, which includes the house and attached garage. While in this neighborhood, an increase in building coverage isn't necessarily common, there are a number of other lots uh, with a greater percentage of coverage um, than what's permitted in the district. Um, because there's an accessible alley to the rear of the site, a greater, permitting a greater percent um, of building coverage on the site, um, staff fills would be appropriate. So planning staff is recommending the Planning Commission approve the plan development requests as staff has found the proposed development meets the intent of the underlying zoning district, the applicable master plans, and the planned um, development standards. Um, I didn't receive any public comments during the review, um, and I did see the applicant um, under Jesus Barella was present in the meeting, um, and I'm also available for any questions the commission may have for me. Okay, thank you, Nan. Um, any questions for uh, staff at this time? Um, I have a question, Madam Chair. Um, this is Amy Burroughs. I wonder if could we approve um, some of the exceptions, like lot size, and not some of the others, like setback? Could we approve all the requests except for setback exception? You can make yeah conditions that alter certain components of that. That's that is our purview, yeah. Anybody else? Okay, so, so we do have the applicant, Jesus and Amalia are here. We are, can you hear us? We can. Do you have a presentation you need sharing, screen sharing yeah. for? We do not have a presentation, we just have a statement and also would like to ask Nan if she can post a uh, picture of the aerial picture of the lot surrounding. Okay, sure she can pull that up. Amalia, this is the only one that I have. Does this That's work? Great. That's great. Thank you so much. Okay, you. if you guys would um, just state your name so it's pronounced correctly for the record and then go ahead. Well, well, good, e well good evening to all of you. This is Jesus and Amalia Barola. Thank you for letting us present uh, uh, tonight. Uh, I would like to thank Danette Larson for sure and for everyone else that was involved in all the work that led to, to us being here tonight. Uh, I don't want to keep you um, long, so I'll just dive right in. We purchased this existing house back in 2018. Uh, and when we were looking to purchase, what caught our eyes as we were driving was like, why is there a, an empty lot next to the house? Um, uh, if you can see, uh, just driving through the neighborhood or the actual street, um, you can see that um, all of the houses are super close together. Uh, and it looks very obvious, it's very obvious that there's something missing there. Our plan. Um, so deal something that completes the street, matches the look of the neighborhood, and makes you know the makes it look more cohesive. Uh, one of the uh, planning city initiatives uh, says to promote infill and redevelopment of under 
utilized land. I think this would be fulfilled as well as accommodating and promoting an increase in the city's population. Um, we have been in contact with our south neighbor, um, Tanya Andrews, who owns the south property, which is the property that would have the most impact, I guess, uh, because of the close easement, the, the, the setbacks on the side. Um, she has no objections. Um, uh, if you have a chance to, gla to glance at that, um, that, which is on the screen right now, you can see how the lot, it's clearly, it, it looks very obvious, like double the size of the other ones that are, that are right next to it. Um, and it's not included on the on the planning report, but most of the houses on the neighborhood have one or two feet um, uh, of easement next to the the next property. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if, it, but, but we do. We did submit it, some pictures that show that. Um, uh, yeah, most of the most of the setbacks, the site setbacks on that street are less, are three, two feet. Some of them are 1.5 feet. Um, uh, and just to finish, we have noticed uh, an increased rehabilitation in the houses in our street and even in the neighborhood streets. So we would like to contribute to it. We appreciate your time and your considerations on this project. Thank you so much. And we are open to, for any questions. Okay, thank you. I believe the site photos for commissioners is in our Dropbox on page nine and 10. Um, I don't know if you submitted those or those were ones that Nan took, but they give a- Those were yeah. ones that staff provided, Chair. Um, yeah, thank you for finding that. I was trying to find that on my staff report, but it didn't look like it loaded very well in the PDF. So thank you. It happens. I, um, all right, any questions for the applicant at this time? I actually have a question about, okay, never mind. I found it. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Those are the best questions. Yeah, right. Those are the ones I answer for myself. Okay. Um, uh, barring any other further questions, um, we're going to open the public comment period uh, to you. Uh, Rilla's just uh, hold tight until we get through that. Um, we'll open the public comment period now. Kelsey, any um, attendees who wish to speak on this? There are no hands raised. I do just want to remind um, anybody in the attendee audience, if you would like to make a public comment this evening, there is a small hand icon in the lower right hand corner. Uh, please click that icon to indicate if you'd like to speak on an item or send an email to planning.comments at slcglv.com. That way we can know if you'd like to speak. Otherwise, uh, Chair, Barry, we do not have any hands raised. Okay, um, John, any emails? It's starting to sound like a broken record, but no emails. Okay, thank you. With that, I will close the public comment period and bring it back to the commissioners for a discussion. Um, and if you have any further questions or a motion. I have a question. I'd like I'm sorry, go ahead. Go, go, go ahead. I have a question for staff and actually for, um, it's, it, it um, so in a conditional use, uh, uh, excuse me, in a planned development, um, it's, it's higher, uh, it's held a higher standard, right, than just any, um, any other project that's sort of any like house that's built in the neighborhood. Isn't that correct? Um, so in my staff report, I went through each of the criteria for a plan development um, yeah. and I believe my rationale of why I thought that um, it met the um, criteria for a plan development. Um, well, uh, what that, was, that, go ahead. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm interrupting. <laughs> um, what was talked about in the staff report, um, there's no other criteria that um, the applicant um, would need to meet in order to develop the site besides the typical standards of an R1, set, um, an R1 5000 zoning district. Why is that? Why don't they have to come actually propose a project? And because part of the standards are, you know, whether the building orientation and building materials are compatible with the neighborhood, whether it maintains a visual character in the neighborhood, whether the scale, mass and intensity are, you know, appropriate for the neighborhood. So it's not just 
whatever you could already build an R1, R1 R1 5000. Is that not true or not? So the measure that I that I used in determining uh, compatibility or um, like some of the criteria of the plan development um, approval is that the setbacks are compatible to the larger neighborhood. Um, not necessarily, I didn't see that as the design um, of the building, but the the design of the site setbacks, but I could be incorrect um, if, you know, the commission would prefer to see a, a building design and that's um, a route that we could take. I, I you know, I just, it, it just struck me in the language that you were looking at, you know, through the standards that you were basically using the zoning as, a, you know, the minimal kind of zoning as a standard rather than reviewing this at a higher standard that's appropriate for a for a planned development. And I wondered why. And I can jump Whether in at this point, Commissioner yes. Shear. Yeah. Uh, we have used the plan development process to create these lots for these um, kind of large, deep parcels that may not meet the lot width requirement for a standard subdivision in a single family residential area, which is why they're subject to the plan development process to create that additional lot. Um, and we take them through this with typically without building plans so that they can create this lot, determine appropriate setbacks, and then go through the permitting process for a single family residential. So we're not paying any attention to the actual standards. Well, the standards to create. It's just a question. It's not an accusation. I mean, yeah, I mean, the standards ask us to look at the landscaping, the parking areas, the lighting, the facade, the set, you know, it, the materials, you know, in other words, these are the things which the standards wants us to look at and we're not doing that. Is that because we don't have any, we don't even have that information. Yes, yeah, so we would use the applicable standards for the proposal in front of us. And so since we don't have, uh, you know, elevations to analyze for materials, we're not going to analyze materials. We'll analyze the lot in bulk in reference to the larger neighborhood. So is this a, I mean, I, I'm not trying to pick on you, Kelsey, or the staff at all. I'm just trying to understand how we can have a plan development, a set of plan development standards that we're basically ignoring because we don't have the data. Commissioner Shear, um, if I could yeah. um, give the way that I looked at this. Um, to qualify for a plan development, um, you need to meet one of the, um, I think it's five objectives of a plan development. And um, they met the master plan compatibility objective and then all of the other criteria in the plan development, uh, staff reviewed against um, the preliminary plat draft um, that we received. And in some cases, um, like landscaping, we didn't ask for detailed information on landscaping um, because it uh, they could meet the criteria for landscaping if they met the criteria for an R15000 zoning district landscaping requirements. Um, and they do meet the front yard, um, front yard setback standards. They're not asking for a modification to the front yard setback standards. Um, so just the development objective, um, they don't necessarily need to show information on each of the criteria because they can still meet the criteria as long as they meet the standards of an R15000. Any other questions for staff? Okay, well, we are at the end. I just had one quick question. Um, was, have there, has there ever been a, a house on this property previously, to anyone's knowledge? Or? When I looked at um, the 
uh, history of the site. I think the subdivision was in 1888. Um, and the only building permit that I was able to find is on the single family house um, on the site. I can't remember off the top of my head what date that was, but I couldn't find a second home being built on the site. Any other uh, questions or discussion or a motion? I'd like to make a motion, please. Go ahead, Andrew. Uh, based on the information in the staff report, I move that the planning commission approve the planned development petition PLN PCM 2020-00464 with the condition that a preliminary subdivision is approved and recorded with the county prior to the issuance of the building permit. I'll second that. Okay, I have a motion. From Andra and a second from Mike. Any discussion to that motion? Okay, we'll go ahead and vote on that. Uh, John. Yes. Andreas. I'm oh, sorry, I'll vote yes. Thank you. Maureen. Yes. Amy. Um, yes, and can I say something real quick? Sure. Um, I want to say that um, making narrower lots and smaller setbacks is, uh, I don't think I like that very much, but the fact that it matches what's already there um, and meets the character of the rest of the street, that was, that moved me to say yes. So yes. <laughs> okay, that's good. Mike. Yes. Andra. Yes. And Brenda. I'm going to vote no, because I believe that we don't have enough information to evaluate whether this project meets the standards of the um, of uh, plan development, including we do not have any architectural drawings so that the applicant could actually build something that was quite incompatible with the neighborhood based on the footprint uh, that's available there and the height that is allowed. Okay, thank you. All right, with that, the motion passes. Six to one. Um, okay, that is a uh, congratulations for all us. Um, you can move ahead with that plan development. Our next agenda item is uh, the Coachman mixed use plan development at approximately 1301 South State Street. That is case number PLN PCM 2021-00898 and the planner is Katya. Hello, um, let me um, share my Can you all see my presentation? Yes. All right. So this project is a plan development uh, located on 1301 South State Street. Uh, it is on the FBUN2 zoning district. Um, it will be uh, on the FB. UN2 zoning district. And the request is for uh, an additional front facade. Uh, the requirement is um, no more than 200 feet. And uh, the applicant is um, proposing um, a, fuss, uh, a building that is uh, 551, uh, approximately 551 uh, feet of um, front facade and also um, additional front yard setback on the corner facing 1300 South um, where the, the um, zoning requirement is uh, zero front, front setback and um, the, the proposal is 23 feet. Um, this is uh, drawing of 
um, the proposed uh, project. Uh, the development would be a mixed use uh, six story building with an underground parking, uh, restaurant, uh, and commercial on the ground level, um, structure parking and storage on the second level, and then three uh, floors above with uh, residential condominiums, um, about 112 units. Um, the Residential component would be uh, consistent consist of um, studios, one bedroom, two bedroom. Um, they would be owner occupied, according to the the applicant would like it to be owner occupied, and also um, the the intent is to make this an affordable housing project. These are. Um, renderings of the proposed project, um, and you can see um, how the the proposed um, the residential uh, component sort of setbacks uh, farther behind uh, the front, the ground level, and the ground level uh, would be uh, split and broken into three sections. Uh, with uh, these parking access sort of breaking the building down. The existing conditions, right now there is a restaurant and some commercial uh, property that would be demolished. And also uh, should note that there's the Parley's Creek that runs through the site and uh, in underpass uh, with a con concrete culvert. These are the properties surrounding it. Most of the, the properties are zoned CC commercial corridor. And with the exception of the east abutting property, which is a uh, multifamily residential, and it's uh, in the RMF 45 zoning district. More of the surrounding properties. As you can see, they all have been built uh, with the CC um, zoning district uh, requirements. So the main ask for uh, the plan development is to modify the requirement that um, the on the FB UN2, where it, it, it requires that the front facade be no more than 200 feet. And that is um, the purpose for that is to have uh, distinct spaces that it's more of a human scale and comparable to the pedestrian. And on this case, what the applicant is trying to achieve is to break down the building with these entrances to the parking and also breaking down with uh, modulation on the top floors and material um, of, and color. Um, staff finds that um, it, might, it might be um, there's an option here for the Planning Commission to um, request a little bit more uh, work on breaking down uh, this building, although this um, approach uh, is is something that uh, planning finds that it could work if it could, you know the the this big uh, long building could be broken down through design and a material and the modulation. Um, there is also uh, what we are suggesting is maybe um, if, if the planning commission finds it uh, appropriate to further um, distinct, you know, these three sections and having uh, 
the ground floor sections um, be more um, com compatible with the, the 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 modulation and the change in design and and material and color from the three top floors. So make uh, the you know these three sections more distinct. Um, the other modification uh, the applicant is asking is uh, the uh, additional front yard setback in the corner uh, yard facing 300 south. Uh, it, 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 it would be um, what, what the required front yard setback is zero and you can go um, beyond zero for 50% of the of this um, facade, but there uh, the the this application is asking for more than 50%, and they're asking for 23 feet of a setback. Which um, the reason for is because of uh, utility lines that exist on the, on this property, and uh, so that no. Um, construction is done underneath the, these um, utility lines. Uh, staff finds that um, this uh, request is appropriate since uh, the, the sidewalk on 13th South is only about five feet wide. So by extending the setback, you would uh, extend their the project would also extend the, the pedestrian walkway on 13th South and uh, allow for trees along the, the, the street. Another thing to point out is, uh, as I said before, uh, this project uh, is um, the, the Par Parley's Canal, it runs through this property and um, where one of the the, the parking accesses uh, access is is where the canal would go through, and it would have a sixteen uh, foot clearance uh, vertically, and then fifteen feet uh, clearance both ways horizontally. And so um, the uh, Salt Lake City uh, County flood control has already given uh, the applicant um, preliminary approval for 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 uh, to build this, um, and um, there will be more um, review from the Salt Lake County flood control uh, when it's time. Uh, for for the building uh, permit. Um, so our recommendation from the planning staff is that um, it meets the intent of the zoning district um, and uh, the plan development standards uh, and plus the applicable master plans. This is uh, Building that would be um, sort of the catalyst for uh, other projects on State Street, um, and so um, we recommend uh, approval with uh, conditions. And uh, the first condition was that the applicant um, comply with other uh, department comments and conditions and uh, that the lighting be delegated to staff as a condition of approval, and uh, that staff is also given the ability to make necessary modifications to the approval um, when um, the, the uh, um, plan goes to um, building permit uh, and the county flood might um, have some additional uh, requirements. 
And in addition to that, um, staff finds that if the Planning Commission finds that this project um, needs to have additional uh, conditions to make um, the length of the building uh, more appropriate, uh, that it that uh, it, it can um, add to those conditions. Um, with that, I uh, just would like to mention that uh, there are were two comments, one from um, George uh, Chapman uh, with that was was included on your Dropbox and also uh, another comment from the Central Ninth uh, Community Council. Um, and maybe you haven't heard th that comment yet, so uh, we might need to read that. Uh, but those were the only two comments that uh, staff has received for this project. And with that, I, uh, you're welcome to ask me any questions. Thank you, Concho. At this time, uh, commissioners, any questions for staff? Um, yeah, I have a few questions, Katja. Um, my first yeah. question is when you said that the developer intends to make this or would like to make this an affordable housing project, maybe you can explain a little bit more on what you heard from that person. Uh, my second question is what the unit mix is planned to be between studio, one bedrooms and two bedrooms. Uh, and then my third question is, I, I read, I understand the concern about the very long facade. And I'm wondering about how much it would increase the cost per square foot to make some of the modifications that the ninth and ninth community council is suggesting. So, um, your 1st question, um. I think that might be um, more appropriate for the applicant to address. Um, uh, so sure. you, you know, as far as the, the affordable housing, um, this, the, you know, I've asked the, the applicant about it and uh, there is no process that he is, has entered into, um, for example, getting, um, you know, any incentives for, for uh, having that as a, uh, Affordable housing, it's at, at this point, it's just his intention. So there's no, uh, you know, um, anything to show that that it will be a, 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 an affordable housing. It, so after, um, after the applicant's presentation, Andrew, I think that question um, should definitely be posed to them. Okay. Any other thing for staff? Okay, I have, I have a question. This is Amy Burroughs. Go ahead, Amy. The, um, the map that shows the 23 foot um, setback from the sidewalk instead of zero feet shows a drawing of the restaurant, which I assume is the existing Coachman's restaurant. Is that currently 20? The edge of that building is 23 feet away from the sidewalk on 13th South. That's what that drawing looks like. So I wonder if that's they're just going to match what's there right now. I don't believe so, but that's a good question for the architect. And uh, I believe he's here. He's the African uh, and would be. Could you bring up that drawing, that page that shows the, sure. the setback? What page are you looking on, Amy? Just out of curiosity. Oh, I, I'm not looking at it in Dropbox. I was just talking about her presentation. Let me see. Okay. Right here. It's got it's got a little that right there. See that 23 feet down there from the edge of this 13th South to the restaurant. I mean, I guess you're putting in a restaurant in this building. Yes. No. What's that drawing of? That is the plan from from the African is to put uh, a new coachman restaurant in this location on the corner. I believe it's more than what it is now, but you know, that's something that the architect can um, better answer. And that will be, is that separated in any, I mean, is this driveway that's behind the restaurant in between a parking lot, is that 
covered up by building above that then? So this is uh, just a driveway. Uh, and um, and I apologize, this, okay. this, um, this drawing here shows um, parking uh, that, yeah. but the parking is going to be actually, um, there will be a parking landscape um, between, so there won't be 10 parking, there's going to be about two to three uh, parallel parking. What? Well, what? Very much. what? Where's the parallel parking? Let's, let's let's hold off on uh, these architectural drawings and tell the applicant. Okay. He'll, okay. Think, let's have him yeah, explain I saw this, those. I saw this drawing of a restaurant and I'm like, it's the old coachman's. I love it. Put it back yeah, in, but let's, it's not. Let's yeah. have the applicant okay. dissect his can, can, can I ask you a question before we have the applicant? It's about parking. Well, yes. is, this is an FBUN2 zone. Uh, what, is the par what is the maximum parking allowed in an FBUN2 zone? So uh, we calculate on the FBUN because there is a zero parking requirement on the FBUN too. And so how we calculate the, the maximum is by looking at the required uh, parking for the restaurant, for the individual users. The, the restaurant, uh, the residential component, the retail component. And so that is the maximum. So the applicant is at the maximum amount of parking that's allowed. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, with that, we do have the applicant here. I'm going to butcher your last name, Ryan Makowiak. Makowiak. Oh, gosh, sorry. And uh, Mike Nichols, I assume you have a more f formal presentation. You do need um, screen sharing rights to. Um, are you going to do that, Ryan, or am I going to do that? I'm not sure. So I actually don't have any anything more than what uh, Katya's proposed necessarily. We can certainly answer the questions, but Mike, as the as the property owner, wanted to kind of uh, lead us in, and then I can uh, answer any questions with regard to the technical aspect. Okay. We're going to have a lot of questions, Ryan. So we're definitely going to need some of your, uh, some of these specs up for sure. Okay. I was hoping you might have a little bit better on the drawings for us, but we'll do what we have. Okay, uh, Mr. Nichols, if you want to start off, um, as the applicant, you will have 10 minutes and the time is yours. Okay, thank you. I appreciate everything that everybody's doing, just so you all know that, taking the time uh, to look at this project. We've been, I've been working on it for four years. Uh, my father owned Coachman's, started Coachman's 60 years ago. Uh, we purchased the property to the south of us. Um, obviously, landscape and, and things have changed there. Um, those buildings were in dire need of, of some uh, uh, rehabilitation, but I just didn't feel that that was the proper use for that area. I mean, it was really uh, designed wrong because it was designed in the 70s and it was just not working. So we made this, I made the decision, both of us, my father and I, to do this. And we've been working on it for a very, very long time. Um, we've tried to overcome all obstacles in the way. Uh, the creek is one. We've addressed it with the county. The county has given us a green light. They want 16 feet above, 15 feet on each side of the culvert so that they can do any work if need be. They're also going to address that when we uh, unearth things and they want to look at it at that time. And as well as that, we, we've uh, done a lot of, of design work on this. And, you know, we really want it to look good. And that's why you're seeing the picture you're seeing there is we, we want it to look really good. And I do believe it's going to be a catalyst. The other thing uh, for future development there, the other thing when somebody was asking about affordable um, uh, housing, I mean, I, I call it affordable ownership. These are condos. There's going to be approximately 60% uh, two bedroom, 40%, I'm sorry, 50% two bedroom, 40% one bedroom, and the rest are gonna be four, uh, th uh, three bedroom on the corners of the top units, the, the fifth level, and the rest we're gonna take up with the, the uh, studios, okay? But the idea is, and I, I pitched this to the city council before and, and to the uh, community council, um, 
who all like the idea. I mean, I just always felt that people are, are putting money in for rents and they're exorbitant right now. And I just felt I would love to see a, a young family or a young person professional that can afford something and have an asset rather than just a rent. When they walk away, they have nothing. I, I mean, my objective is to create these really nice units. They're not gonna be cheap. They're gonna be great and basically give it at the best possible price that I can. This design takes all that in, in, into contemplation. So that's how I, we, we develop this. Um, now with the openings on the front of the building, I believe if that building was built right now and somebody was to stand in front of it or drive by it, it would not look like one long building. You're gonna have a, a 50 foot opening for that double wide where the creek is. And then you're gonna have another, I can't remember the exact dimensions, but they're approximately 25 feet on the further north entrance. And that breaks up those where it does not look like it's just one solid wall of building. Okay, and then on the uh, lady that uh, asked about the the setback on, on the, the 13th South and the corner there. So Coachman's currently, we used to have a lot of property there, but the city bought it from us and they extended 13th South when the floods came through. I mean, I know I was there and I know what happened and they had to deal with us. So they purchased a lot of property. We had an extra approximately 18 feet before they widened 13th South and put all those culverts down 13th South. So what now happens is they have put, let, let's say, I think it was approximately 30 feet. They took 15 feet from us. So now what has transpired is we only have about 10 feet worth of grass back there with a pony wall, retaining wall, and then you have the sidewalk. It is literally right next to the street curb gutter, that sidewalk. I went down there to try to remove snow because the plows pushed it onto that sidewalk today, just came back about an hour and a half ago. That's at least three feet thick and nobody can walk down that. And I'm gonna have to get a backhoe just to get it off of there. So in my own humble opinion, being set back there is gonna be much better besides the fact that we've got power lines that we've already talked to Rocky Mountain Power about that we have to be set back a certain point for the arc around it and everything else. So the setback there was addressed early on. The culvert we've tried to address early on and, and try to get as many answers as possible. Um, we've got these two openings to try to address that. And then let me just tell a little bit about the building. On top of the second level, there is going to be outdoor amenities with uh, hot tubs, barbecues. So you're gonna be above street level. So people aren't, people aren't looking into you and, and you've got some privacy and it's gonna be huge. You can see it right in the middle of the building right there. That's all gonna be outdoor amenities. Inside are indoor amenities, gyms, uh, pool table and a little meeting rooms and things like this. That way the people that are outside are not looking into your condo. So the condos on that level extend out from there on, on to the south and to the north. Now on the second and third level, you get full usage of all of the uh, space for condos. But we haven't just applied, how can I say, all building, all uh, livable space, all everything. We're looking at trying to make amenities and, and make it really, really functional for the city, for the people. And I want affordable ownership for a reason. That area, as everyone that lives in the city well knows, there's been a problem with, I, I don't want to say what I've had to do, but it, it's been a big problem. There's been people that break into cars, break into businesses. I've had both of my businesses within the last two weeks broke in three times. But anyway, uh, and it's just a mess. Eyes on the street are going to change everything. If we have affordable ownership and you own it, you're looking into that. If you're just there for six months and gone, it changes everything. And then you've got retail on the bottom, which is the same thing. Everybody has to protect their business, otherwise they're not gonna have one. So my objectives are always the community and always that property and area. I, I, I just think it needs a revitalization. And with that, I'm gonna let uh, Ryan answer any technical questions that any of you might have. Thank you for your time, all of you.
Thank you, Ryan. Did you want to um, address um, some of the uh, design questions? Yeah, if I, can, if I can share, uh, Kat, does that mean you have to release your share? I can certainly kind of show a couple exhibits with yeah. regard to the existing coachman. I can uh, do that right now. Just one moment, Ryan. Okay. I've paused your time for this, um, but you'll have about three minutes after that. Okay. And then we'll have questions. So okay, there you go. All right. Let's see if we can do this. Okay, so let me show you the kind of the, the difference between what Mike just kind of mentioned with regard to the proximity to the curb with the existing Coachman's uh, restaurant building and then the proposed as it as it shifts back a little bit. So to open up that little plaza right there, I think would be a, a huge benefit just for a lot of reasons, some of which Mike just enumerated. Um, and then uh, one of the things I wanted to make sure we clarify as well in is Katja's presentation. She mentions it's a six-story building. Technically, it is one of those stories is below grade. Um, so as Mike mentioned, uh, as we as we look at this from a pedestrian standpoint, uh, the street side is going to be broken up into these three three sections, if you will, that'll all be have different uses within them. Uh, and it won't, I hope the idea obviously is that it won't feel quite so imposing at that street level. Um, I wanted to show also, now that I remember, one of the questions with regard to the parking that Kati mentioned. Um, the image that she showed in her presentation was a little bit, uh, was, it was quite out of date. Um, so this is the existing curb cut off of 1300 South, and this will remain. Right now there's angled, or excuse me, there's uh, parallel, uh, Front end parking coming right up against this building, actually crossing this property line. Well, we had to we had to sh cut that back to maintain a seven foot landscape strip right across here. So that's the parallel parking that she mentioned across here. So this is all uh, uncovered parking. Once you jump into here and kind of cross into this plane, that's when you come inside the building. There are ramps, there's structured parking, and so forth. Uh, and so um, so that's kind of how the the initial drive would 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 work with that existing curb cut there. Um, let's see, we went over a whole lot in those last few comments. Was there, what, the, what other questions was, were there that I could answer? Okay, um, with that we will bring it to the commissioners for questions. Um, who would like to start? Um, can I start, Amy? Um, yes. Thank you very much. I'm, I I want to first say that I'm really excited that you guys are going to do condos. We have a lack of condos, I think, in this city. For some reason, developers seem to be oddly hesitant about condos in Salt Lake. And I'm excited that there's a good set of two bedroom units. I'm excited there's going to be some three bedrooms. I, I am slightly sympathetic to some of the comments in the Central Ninth's um, public comment about the facade and I, you know, I am also sympathetic to your desire to keep this an affordable project, and I realize that some requests to change this will add to the costs and take it out of that affordable realm by any sort of stretch of what we define as affordable. Can you, I don't know how closely you've looked at the, the public comment from Central Ninth, but can you maybe speak to what they, you know, when they suggested you vary the, the height, the, the distance of setbacks or add some courtyards? Is that feasible? How much cost are we adding approximately? Can you comment a little bit on their on their comment? So by way of cost, um, that's a little bit above my own pay grade. Uh, I don't get into estimating a whole lot with that in that regard. Um, and I did not see the comment, but what we have done, as, as Katya mentioned, is we've got at street level, we've got these three separate, uh, you know, in, in concept anyway, three separate buildings. Um, we've tried to align relatively closely with shifts in material, with color, and with regard to the uh, proximity to the street of the uh, condos up against uh, State Street. So uh, in her presentation, she had a kind of uh, building two kind of broken up over here. So looking at this, this is uh, north is to the left on this. So we sort of saw that break to coincide with the south side of this parking drive right here. We, we broke up the building here, changed material, uh, changed the massing, 
and then did the same thing. Now, again, so uh, even this, even this portion that here, this, this yellow portion of the building, it's already set back from the face of this building at the street level. And then as you move further south, again, you're now at, let's call it building two at the street level. This portion of the residential above sets back even further. And that's the large courtyard that Mike was mentioning where you'll have a lot of common, common amenities for the tenants. And uh, that's, that'll be a really, really nice kind of urban feel to that place. And then as we continue to move south, then we jump into building three, the level, uh, the, the base, if you will, of level three, uh, or excuse me, of building three. And then again, this now comes back towards the street a little bit, back towards, towards State Street with a little bit of a kind of a movement back Again, to give a little bit more uh, separation between, call it uh, the upper levels of building one, two, and three. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, I have, I have a couple of questions. Um, so, in your unit mix, uh, you have 112 units. Uh, by my count, you have 23 two bedrooms, uh, 58 one bedrooms, and 31 studios. So, you actually don't have three bedrooms on the plans at all. And, uh, and I, is that, am I wrong here? And also you have studios, which you didn't mention, I mean, it was not mentioned. So I'm, I'm sort of wanting to recalculate the parking requirements because it looks to me like you have a lot more parking than you actually are allowed to have. I don't, I don't see a chart where that's been, where that's been, uh, you know, calculated. So the unit mix does seem to be somewhat in flux. Mike and I have been working on that, uh, trying to figure out the best way to handle, um, you know, that balance between the right number of units, the right size of units, the right bedroom count and so forth. So that we're, we are kind of working through. So Katya, I wonder if I could punt back to you a little bit, if you could explain, because we were quite frankly, a little confused with regard to the parking requirement uh, for this FBUN2 zone. Um, there is a minimum requirement, which was zero, and then the maximum requirement referred back to the minimum requirement uh, with regard to parking. So um, what we did end up doing, uh, we have on, uh, or I have rather on my cover sheet, a breakdown of all those stalls as, they're, uh, as we've provided them, as the different uses are gonna be required. So this is how we've broken it up. For a studio, we have a half stall per unit, for a single one bedroom, a single uh, single stall, and then for a two bedroom, two stalls. And then we have uh, the commercial spaces with uh, that are according to the chart in the in the zoning ordinance for this for this zone. But those are the kind of the maximum park. Those are the maximum parking requirements. And if you're really trying to do something that's affordable, that's a place where you can really uh, save a lot of money because all of your parking is structured as far as I can see. Is that Agreed. correct? Pretty close. Yeah. 90, 90% of it. So, um, I mean, it, it is a lot of parking, um, in a place that's fairly urban, that's supposed to be, you know, uh, an urban zone where people would not necessarily have two parking spaces. It's certainly not just for a two bedroom unit. So, um, I think you're way over parked on this one and that may be a way for you to really save a lot of money and even maybe uh i don't i don't know maybe the underground parking doesn't even need to be built so um it it seems like this is a little bit not worked out uh both from the standpoint of the of the um of the facade which um i can see you know the separation happening on the ground floor i think that's you know that's that's happening on the ground floor. I'd like to see it reflect and, and it's somewhat uh, uh, carried up. I think it's carried up uh, through the architectural um, facade, um, distinguishing uh, materials on the second floor and, um, and, and that's okay. Uh, but I think um, some of the comments that the um, um, neighborhood council had really need to be taken to heart and I don't know what the, um, I can't tell from your, from your drawings, what the height of the ground floor is. Um, so do you have, um, there's sort of 
in your elevation, what is the height of the ground floor? Because sure. that was one of their comments. And I, I agree that a, a generous ground floor makes a huge difference in the way the whole thing is worked out. I see. Yeah, agreed. So the big one of the obviously we've talked about this Parley's Canyon uh, clearance. So that's really kind of the driving force be behind uh, a nice high second level. So right now we're at 18 feet. That should give us enough. Once we get our structure in yeah. there, we have that 16 foot clearance at the at the drive, and uh, okay. great retail space on that street side. Okay, that's good. No, 16 is fine. That's good. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. So, but the but the issue with the parking is still. I mean, we don't. I mean, the whole idea of our new parking ordinance and every other thing is that we don't over park. We don't have more parking than we really need um, to have. So if I recall, and like I said, it, it, I'd be curious to hear back from Katya again, because just the way the, the zoning ordinance with this FBUN2 is written, there is no maximum parking. Uh, it refers simply back to the minimum parking table required, and the minimum was zero. So what we ended up doing, I believe, we went to a, a, a similar or an adjacent zone that did have a maximum parking and uh, use those standards as our as our guideline because the FBUN2 just was. was I'm, I'm pretty sure FBUN2 has a maximum. So, Kathy and me or someone else, maybe um, Kelsey, you can answer that. Yeah, I can jump in real quick. So, um, you are correct that there's no minimum required in the FBUN2 specifically. Um, in that table for a zone specific, FBU and two does not require any parking. However, if you refer to the minimum off street parking requirements per use, um, that's where you would calculate your parking. So based on how many dwelling units, um, square footage of restaurant and retail space. So we would right. break it down per use, which is what uh, Ryan has done on this cover sheet. Does that well, mean that the, the minimum for that use is the maximum for that zone? What we use for the maximum is the, the requirement for each land use. So for each land use, there's uh, in the parking uh, chapter, there is, um, you know, for, for residential, there's uh, a required uh, parking uh, for retail, for restaurants. So we used that number um, and calculated the maximum yeah. parking. Okay. So the, the minimum for that land use turns into the maximum if, when you're in this um, walkable I, zoning. Oof. Is that, that not sound right? I, it, that, that doesn't sound right to me. I mean, what's the point of having a zero uh, requirement if you don't have zero requirement if you actually have to build, you know, all of this parking. Well, Commissioner, I don't think it's a zero requirement. It's an allowance to provide zero parking. Right. Um, and, so, and, so, and so why do we have confusing. all these? Why why do we have this calculation when you know? So, so you're saying that this is the maximum? They've taken the max the maximum here and and made it and made it what they're building. I would say it's as close to the maximum as you can get, um, and 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 certainly they they have to follow those regulations. I mean, we we're not going to let them build more parking. And you're right that we want to encourage less parking. I completely agree with you on everything you said. Thankfully, this will be a lot more clear when the council adopts our updated parking regulations um, from what we currently have, and that you, I believe, reviewed. I don't know a year and a half ago, two years ago. Yes, yes um, we did. So, and, and, and so it, it is confusing and I get that, um, but yes, we have determined that basically the minimum parking becomes the maximum. And so if, if not, we basically saying you can't put any parking in at all. If we said the maximum is the minimum, which is zero, we would be saying you can't put even one parking stall in. And I don't think that that is necessarily reasonable either. And so this is what we took when we interpreted the section of the code. Um, so hopefully we're on the, it will get better and easier. Okay. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Um, any other questions from commissioners? I, I wonder that um, that existing um, office building that's going to be demolished. How how long is it? 
it's pretty That's long. Good question. I know it's over that 200 feet. See if we can get in. Oh, I see. Is it really divided like that, or are those just stairways? Those are just stairways, those are right? yeah. These those are interior stairways. stairways. It's it's yeah. one contiguous building. These are really just um, uh, circulation, pedestrian circulation. But that's, I mean, it, and it's got the same kind of thing. You drive underneath the building, so really, we, I mean, we're a little bit longer than what's there existing. But honestly, by the time, really, the only thing we're adding really that's different from what there is kind of this this open spot right here, this open asphalt here. Well, it's certainly if you're walking on that street, it's different to have a big parking lot and then a shorter building that's long than a tall building that's right at the sidewalk that is long, right? So it's, I mean, sure. I think it's a big difference, but that is already a pretty long building right there. Right. Uh, Commissioner Burroughs, I measured it, and this is going to be an approximate, but it's about 425 feet. That's pretty long. That's pretty long. So I, have a, I also have a question about your setback, your 23 foot setback on the corner. Um, so, um, it's a narrow side, it's a narrow sidewalk there. True. But, um, how did you come up with 23 feet? I mean, if, if you increase the sidewalk to say 15 feet, um, so, even. Yeah. So the, there, there's good size distribution lines with Rocky Mountain power already on the site. They actually, if I remember right, if they don't already hang over the existing roof of the coachman's restaurant they're very very close to it so as we started looking at that with new construction we're actually there's two big concerns one is undermining the foundations for those uh power lines but then there are also because there are distribution and transmission lines there there's also rocky mountain power requirements as to how close you can be with a built structure to those uh power lines so if you can consider a five-story building that has to need that the, the exterior windows need to be cleaned, somebody's got to get out on the roof, come down over the edge and clean those windows from the roof. They can only be within a certain distance or they can only come as, you know, a certain amount, uh, a certain distance to those prop power lines. And so a lot of it is a function of the, the, the location of the power lines, how wide those power lines are, and then the setbacks from those uh, power lines, the outer reach of those power lines. Okay, thank you. So I just had a simple question, I guess. Um, has you not approved where your curb cuts are? And so your references? Actually, yeah, with regard to the curb cut, that's a great question. Um, I don't know. Actually, Mike, maybe I'll let you. I'll punt to you on that one. I'm not sure if we've if we've finalized our U dot uh, conversations or not. Another another project had a similar problem with UDOT of where where they could put a space into their building. Yeah. Am I able to talk? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I wasn't sure if I was muted. So those are currently where the curb cuts are uh, right now. The one is for Coachman's, and then the further south one is for the Plaza. Um, however, w with the culvert there and everything involved. I felt I thought it was be so much better just to bring traffic in one way and out and widen it there. So the only thing we would be requesting of you dot and we haven't gotten to that just because we need to know what we need to, you know, with this step right now before we can move forward. So basically all we're doing is widening it and making it directional. When you're coming from the south to the north, you'd come in right away and then obviously you can see the arrows where when you're leaving the, the property you would directional as well. So it, it, I think really cleans things up and you've got much better vision of, of the street when you do that, you know, of your of your oncoming traffic and, and pedestrians and everything. I mean, it's just a huge difference when you do things like that. Um, anyway, and then I, I would, uh, okay, that that's fine. I'll, I'll let go. I, I, hope, I hope UDOT shares your vision. I do too. Yes, we all do. Thank you. <laughs> uh, anybody else before I? I uh, I had one quick question. Just uh, what are the uh, the projected sidewalk widths uh, along State Street? I believe the sidewalks uh, are 
in effect, at least along State Street, are, are uh, in effect about what they are right now. We're coming, again, because we have a zero lot line, we're basically, or, yeah, zero lot line. We're coming up to the back of sidewalk with a, a fair portion of, or yeah, I guess maybe portions of our building. We've recessed some of the entrances for the commercial space, but um, I mean, it's five, six feet, give or take. Hmm. That's not very much. Yeah. But that's to the property line again. I mean, we've got a zero setback. We haven't. We're having to uh, maintain. But that's not counting the strip between there, is it? Right. It's not counting. Right. Exactly. That's that's not counting the landscape strip. It's just it's the, actually the sidewalk like alone. Maybe twelve feet, ten to twelve. Yeah, from the curb to the from the curb to the lot. Yeah. So I want to just say that um, I'm really concerned about the length of this building. When I look back on our discussions of other projects that exceeded the length, this is the longest building I've, I have a memory of us ever discussing. We've approved some uh, similar type design where you had an entrance, a vehicle entrance that broke it up, but that building was like 250, 280 feet long. This is double that. And um, I, I'd like to hear um, what other ideas have you um, had to um, actually break these up into maybe even two different buildings. So this is not um, 550 plus feet. Yeah, that's a fair question. Um, you, the tough part is when you get into the uh, buildings like this, um, you know, egress, so you have different building systems, mechanical systems and plumbing systems, and it really becomes a question of egress. How do you get people out of the building uh, without having, you know, 20 different stairwells? And that's, uh, that was kind of really what drove a lot of this. Um, you know, and we've talked about uh, different methods or techniques of, of design that could help reinforce the fact that that uh, we're trying to, you know, reinforce the the uh, the notion that these are three separate buildings. Now, you know, for now we've kept it relatively simple with changes in materials and colors and and recesses and so forth. Um, we felt it was a pretty effective uh, method of of breaking these buildings up. And again, I, uh, the the big concern, at least all that we've that we've talked about with the planning staff, has been the pedestrian experience. And so with, from that perspective, having broken this up into quote unquote three buildings uh, really is achieving in our mind is achieving uh, that that breakup. Okay. So if I can comment on that for just a moment. I mean, the whole, you come up with a plan and, and an objective and my objective is to pro provide condos. And, and by the way, ma'am, to address to you, it was 40, 60, I mean, uh, 40, 50 with some studios to take up the rest of the, 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 the space that I had commented on. And we are working on that just to address that question that was never really answered uh, earlier. But the whole idea here is to create a, a project that people can come in and buy literally one bedroom, two bedroom, uh, three bedroom and a few studios. There's not going to be many, approximately six to eight is all I'm looking at and still make it affordable, which means I'm going to give them a product between 275 up to 450. Okay. And that's what I'm trying to achieve. The, the, this, I can achieve it. If, if I do change it, it's going to be it would be drastically different and and i think this is aesthetically beautiful and would be a wonderful uh place for people to to i mean you're just so close to the city and you're so close to salt lake community college the university western westminster college uh everywhere tracks is just down the road i mean it makes it the ballpark liberty park i mean this would be a wonderful starter home and that was my whole objective in in trying to create this project that will give people an opportunity to do it. I mean, if anybody ate at Coachman's, our mantra was to give you the best for the least price possible. And literally that's what I'm trying to achieve with this whole thing. So I'm not trying to trying to usurp any uh, anything. What we're trying to make it work under those parameters. Mike, can I? Yeah, let me just wrap up and then, and then we're gonna go to the public comment period. 
um, cause we'll cycle back to us um, after that. I will just say that I appreciate your objectives. Um, but um, my view on these type of things has always been as a city, there's we get one shot at this parcel um, in our given lifetimes. And so, you know, paying attention to the type of uh, product that we end up building is important to me. And I'm not convinced 550 some feet of a continuous building is what we want to see there, but um, that, you know, we'll, we'll continue to discuss that afterward. So commissioners, I'm gonna um, just conclude this part, but if you have other questions, hold them for when we come back after the public comment period um, and we can um, ask more questions and have um, more of a wrap up discussion. So if you are uh, here for the public comments, um, just another uh, brief reminder of how to participate in the lower right hand corner of your screen is a hand. It looks like that. You'll need to select that to raise it. Let us know that you wish to speak when you're done speaking. If you would click that hand again, it unraises it and it allows us um, to process or to you know, manage who's speaking better. Um, you will have two minutes um, to speak and given how many people want to speak, I will be pretty strict on that. And then um, please also state your name for the record at the beginning. This is a public comment period. It's not a uh, back and forth Q and A. However, the two minutes are yours. If you wish to ask questions, I will be writing them down. Um, after the public comment period, I will pose them to um, the appropriate person, whether it's staff or applicant. Um, but we won't stop the public comment period for a back and forth Q and A. But don't let that stop you from asking any questions you may have. Okay, Kelsey. Um, you are up in terms of, I'm going to open the public comment period. Okay. And, um, there are no hands raised at this time. Hey, Kelsey, I'm looking at oh. Dr. Anderson and there's a check mark. I don't see a hand, but we may want to ask and see if he or he or she would like to speak. I will. I actually just saw a Robert Smith. Your hand is raised. Let me unmute you. All right, Robert, you are unmuted. So I was just going to say on these on the this building, because the top portion is kind of set back, almost looks like it's a different building, you know, from the street level. Um, the condos aren't, you know, it's not a it's not a continuous facade that goes all the way up five stories. It's it's as if there's a you know retail whatever, and then. In the background, there's there's condos. So, I mean, it's it, it's kind of broken up that way as well. Seems like you know from a aesthetic perspective. Um, okay, uh, he already um, went away. So uh, that was Robert Smith for the record. And then, yeah, I can see a check mark for uh, Dr. Anderson. If you could check with him and see if they want to comment. Hey, Dr. Yeah, Anderson. Yes, we can hear you. Sorry, those were the only, I was getting a weird set of options for the hand raising thing. That's no what I was, and I'm not a doctor either. I don't know why I typed that in, but it's a nickname. <laughs> so, uh, my name is Taylor <laughs> Anderson. And I guess I wanted to reiterate, I know it's a UDOT issue, the sidewalks on the, I guess the west side here. When I'm me measuring from, from Google, and I, I'm maybe one of the few people that willingly walks this stretch. I live near here. And the idea of walking between a building that that's built a, a very long building that's built up to the lot line and then it's only seven feet between including sidewalk and median um and that's approximately but a, about seven to eight feet total between a turning lane on state street um us 89 it just seems un un unpleasant i i know that that's their right that's the the, the fbu n2 has been approved already and this is what's being allowed but I, I wonder if we're doing the same on the north end of the building, if it's a consideration the developer could make to to widen that a little bit or to improve the pedestrian experience on the on the west side of the building. So it's more, I guess, a, a question or a thought or a piece of feedback, however you want to take it. Thanks. Hey, thank you, Taylor. Um, I don't see any other hands raised, but uh, we'll give it a moment. If you want to speak on this item, go ahead and click your hand. Um, at the bottom right, John, have you received any emails? The only email we received was from the Central Ninth Community Council, and it was a little after five. 
I can read it into the record, but if you guys should already have it, um, that's up we to you. We did, but considering that it was a little bit after 5 p.m., I think it's, and it's the community council, I think it's prudent that you go ahead and read it into the record, please. Okay, yeah, I'm happy to do that. Let me pull it up for you. <clears throat> All right, it says the community council is generally supportive of a new high quality building that will bring new housing and businesses to our neighborhood. However, we have reservations about a building that's length with an uninterrupted facade built right up to either the setback or property line. An important urban design principle is that the buildings fronting sidewalks should offer variety and interest for pedestrians. This building is missing the opportunity to offer some planted open space to allow pedestrians a chance to step off the sidewalk at reasonable intervals. The Salt Lake City's overly long block faces, this is even more crucial. As nice as this building appears for the pedestrian walking along it, the experience is likely to be relentless. There may be things and activity to look through, to look out through the window, but there also may not be. There is no way to guarantee the storefronts will be actively used. From an urban design and walkability perspective, the best thing to do on a building of this scale is to break the building facade up into separate masses or vary the setback to the front facade. One way to do this is by introducing one or two courtyards at the sidewalk that allow the public to interact with the space and offer an amenity. There are also useful amenities for the ground level commercial spaces. This open space can be used by the public, even though it is on private property and allows the opportunity to introduce trees and vegetation. Building facade design also impacts the way cars move on the street. When, when buildings are designed with an uninterrupted facade like this, it raises the perceived design speed of a road and makes the street more comfortable to drive at higher speeds. Change, changes in height, form, increased pedestrian activity, increased tree canopy, all work together to lower traffic speed and make streets more sticky, which is a good thing for neighborhoods. Another design concern is the ceiling height of the first floor commercial space. We have a vested interest in seeing these commercial spaces be active and successful and through experience have found that spaces with low ceilings don't do well and have trouble attracting and retaining good businesses. When buildings get taller and larger, the stakes go up. But to offset the possible impacts of the building on the streetscape, we need to insist that the building contributes more to the public realm. We need to begin, in, begin insisting that when a developer is seeking relief from requirements that they offer something in return, a quote, gift to the street. We could ask that this applicant go. We would ask that this applicant go back to the drawing board and find some ways to be a better neighbor and set a better urban design pattern for future projects. Going forward, we ask that the planning department implement a strategy to make it part of granting requests like this that the higher urban design centers are required and variances are granted. With regards, Central Ninth Community Council. Okay, thank you. Yes, um, and we didn't receive any further emails from. No other emails. I see no other hands raised. So, with that, I will close the public comment hearing and bring it back to the commission. Um, first up, I allow the applicant to address uh, Taylor Anderson's thought slash question of increasing uh, the pedestrian pleasantness experience on the west side, given the sidewalk uh, width. You so, want to just make some comments on that? Yeah, so uh, the way the FBUN2 zone is written, and I don't remember exactly the uh, requirements, but there's a portion of the building is required to have a zero lot line. So portions of the building have to be up against that back of curb. Um, and again, I don't remember exactly what the parameters were as to how much of the building had to be that close. But, uh, you know, we've recessed portions of this building for those uh, building entrances for the commercial, for the housing lobby area. We've actually recessed some of those. Uh, we actually had some of them even deeper than what uh, we show right now. And as part of the staff review prior to this meeting, we had to bring those closer to the street in order to be in compliance with the zoning ordinance. Okay, thank you. All right, commissioners, this is our time to do a discussion. Um, any further questions for staff or applicant and um, talk about the project and then do an action. Um, it's Andra here. I, I am wondering a uh, question for Mike and Ryan, what, research was done. I, I'm still concerned about the volume of studio units and that we are building in this city and particularly like what does the ACS show in terms of the growth of uh, single person households in Salt Lake City relative to the number of permits that are being approved for studio and because the only people that are going to occupy a studio are one person households. And so what is the sort of numbers we have on demographics? relative to the number of units approved. So, do you want me to address that, Ryan, or do you want to? Uh, yeah, I don't I don't get into those analytics. All right, because I was going to say, I, I did a lot of uh, analysis through uh, different uh, real estate and, and, and a whole bunch of different people. I, I don't have them in front of me right this very minute, but I can tell you that uh, that's why my count of studios 
is literally going to be somewhere around eight. And literally, I don't want more than that. My thought behind that is that there may be people from out of state that would be attending school that may or may not have uh, or want to, to own a studio. And, and I literally am not going to let that number exceed eight. And Ryan knows that I've been pushing him so that we can get together, but we've been trying to put the material together for this uh, here. Anyway, that we want to redo that count. That count is not accurate. That's from a previous architect that I had. And we, we've just been basically working with so many other obstacles that we haven't got to that count yet because we don't even know if we can do this project yet. But my ideal is, is somewhere around 40 uh, single bedroom, 50 um, two bedroom, anywhere from four to five uh, three bedroom and the remainder to be sucked up by the studios just to, to take up the space so that you know we can utilize the, the space well um we've seen we did you know and also to let you all know condos are really tough to do analysis on because there's not a lot of them around it's all just rentals so it, it, it we had to go a little bit outside of our our uh, you know certain circle to find some of this information and then some of it didn't apply because it was too expensive and it doesn't apply to what i'm going to do you know when you get to gateway and when you get to all those things that that doesn't apply those numbers are not the same as they would apply to this project so we we did a lot and and my study is that this is what's needed i i obviously am banking on it you know otherwise i wouldn't be pushing forward for this project um and then you know the gentleman that from the council that addressed that uh you know first level he wants good retail places there we, we've got 16 foot you know that first level for retail that's going to attract some fantastic people i want to put like a little grocery store i want to find you know like a Harmon's type in holiday right there on that corner i think that would be fantastic and then i'm looking at doing things that will you know one will help the other where you've got uh, maybe an insurance company, uh, maybe a, a really neat salon, uh, maybe a, a, what do you call it, uh, just a lot of little things that will, the tenants will help the, the retail and the retail will love to have those tenants above them as customers. And with 16 foot ceilings and what we plan on doing there, we're going to attract some good ones, like a Verizon would go well there. Uh, things like this, you know what I mean? Thanks very much for that clarification. I was confused, but thank you. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, um, any further discussions? Well, I want I want to recognize what Brenda was saying about um, the other plan development that we looked at. Like the amount of information we have on this one is significantly different than the other plan development we looked at. So maybe, I don't know, maybe there's a different way to split lots or something like that. Um, does this is this building big enough that it's going to have to go through design review? That was twenty thousand no. square feet that you have to. Gotcha. No, the only reason for the uh, plan development is the two modification. Is, how how big is this building? In square footage? Yeah. Uh, I mean. Is I thought um, design reviews required for twenty thousand square feet, right? It depends on the zone. Yeah, Commissioner Burroughs Walcott is looking for that. Um, different zones have different thresholds, which would trigger a design review. So, for example, in the Sugar House Business District, it is twenty thousand square feet. Um, if you're in a community business or a CD zone, it's actually seventy five hundred square feet. Um, the FBN U two does not ever require you going through a design review if you meet all of the um, zoning regulations. We're here because they're asking for modifications through the plan development process. Um, so so I have I'm a, okay. <laughs> I have a lot of questions and comments let me, here. Let me let me get this one in Go really ahead. quick. So sure. um, I think this is more for Kelsey as acting director. So whenever a project um, gets say approved by the planning commission, and then um, you know it's up to the director to decide if modifications are major enough to bring back to us. Um, I'm concerned about also not having um, UDOT approval. Um, that could significantly modify the the entrances and exits 
because UDOT is UDOT and they're going to do whatever they want to do. Um, mm -hmm. That where is the threshold? Because if this gets approved at 550 some feet long, um, there could be some serious modifications. Um, what would trigger that to come back? Um, do you think as a major modification um, given what could happen? Well, if the UDOT chooses to not approve the curb cuts in the proposed locations and it alters the building, that would be considered a major modification. The minor modifications are uh, fairly minimal and they keep to like technical issues with uh, fire or engineering concerns okay. as well as like location of accessory structures, um, landscape buffers, final grade, and then location of open space. Um, there are some, let's see, Justin, yeah, that wouldn't really be a minor modification, especially if it impacted like parking um, vehicular access and circulation on the interior of the site because the building is so long that would impact um, the full facade. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead. So I think actually this, this, from my perspective, this project is not ready for prime time. Number one, we have a unit mix that would suggest that the building is going to be a lot bigger than it actually if you have more three bedrooms and more two bedrooms and, you know, uh, substituting for a lot more one bed. Uh, Brenda, you oh. are getting choppy and freezing up. And I'm <laughs> okay, I'm saying that the, the applicant is talking about changing the unit mix significantly that from what they have actually in the drawings. And when you look at the units in the drawings, there isn't room on that building floor plate to make a lot more three bedroom units and a lot more two bedroom units and a lot fewer studio units. So there will have to be some significant changes to this building in order to meet those unit mixes that the applicant is talking about. I think the issue of the curb cuts and the state will have a tremendous effect. I, I can't imagine them allowing two curb cuts like that next to each other. And when they do that, and, and that may not even be desirable. I do think that it is too long. And there is, um, you know, you, not only is the building um, too long, but it's also got one elevator, as far as I can see. Two elevators. Two elevators. Okay. If it, if it has two elevators already, then it's not that hard for you to um, for you to add another staircase and have a, essentially two buildings where you have one long one. So I think um, I think this building really needs a little bit of a rework from the design perspective. Katya talked in the beginning about um, trying to break up the facade itself more. Um, and I think that at the very least, you could create more of a courtyard effect um, so that maybe not it's maybe it's still all one building, but at least it looks a little bit more like uh, two buildings or three buildings from the st from the street level, which means you would have to break that um, that second level uh, facade, <clears throat> excuse me, that second the second floor. With so, Madam Chair, yeah, can I make a suggestion? Yes, that we table this. And he said they changed architects and things and let them mm -hmm. redo their plans and, in Brenda's words, finish it, make it, make it ready for, comply with what they want to do. If you would like to make a motion, um, please go ahead, but, and we'll see where that lands. If I can just ask one question, uh, I, the only changes we were going to make were internally on that top footprint of the three floors, and that was the mix. And also, um, I there was 120, I think, units on that original drawing. 
I'm dropping it down to 100 to 105 units. Okay. So when you say that it won't fit in there, I understand, but that's what we're working on and, and we are aware of that. Okay, and, thank and, you. and I can appreciate that. So I'm gonna make a move to table this to allow the applicant to finish some of their detail work. Uh, um, would you also, I think it would be helpful for staff if you kind of bullet pointed the specific things so that there's no confusion of maybe the discussion of the commissioners. What? I think to make clear what their um, what their housing mix is going to be, I think they should have their UDOT approval for that because that could be okay. a big change. Will you go ahead and make a motion and then just kind of add those as as points so that staff is um, and applicant is clear about what we're wanting them to okay. address. I, I'll make Come a motion back again and could I, and then could I? they haven't done it. So go ahead, Maureen. As part of that, would it be possible to make a motion to approve the, th the other items that we've requested so that we can kind of leave those untouched? Um, we uh, will. We aren't approving or disapproving. It would be a motion to table it. Yeah, so we're going to go ahead. The commission is now um, going to move forward with whatever actions we take. Um, and go ahead, Maureen. We'll start with that. Um, I'll make a motion to table this item to allow the applicant time to address and and update the unit mix. I think they and have their UDOT approval. Um, give them time to look at additional changes in the facade that make it more pedestrian friendly. Okay, do I have a second for that? Uh, I'll second, but I'd like to add a little bit of a comment if I can. Uh, yes. So I think to help clarify some of the things that I think we're thinking and people can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I'm, I'm personally okay with the overall length of the building, but it's breaking it into a feeling of three different buildings. And I think if you treat each one of those retail spaces with slightly different architecture, um, different material palettes, and then above that, follow that up the building instead of having the little tiny buildings on the top, break that into three sections that feel like three different buildings. I think that would really help. Um, I think your argument, the massing I think is, is headed in the right direction. It's the use of the materials, the amount of glass on the first floor and the articulation of the architecture. That's just my thought, but okay. yes, I'll second the table. One. Okay. So I have a motion for Maureen and a second from John. I don't feel like you're, articulation was anything necessarily different. It was just an elaboration. So I don't I, think you need a friendly I think amendment. I, I appreciate his suggestions. Yes. Can I make a um can I make a friendly suggestion too? Yes. Call it that before, to discuss so the I to. Go ahead. So I, I think maybe they should investigate splitting it actually into two different buildings. So they're because this is so far out of the range of what's um allowed by right that Maybe they should investigate more splitting it into okay. two buildings so they're closer. I think that is um, again not necessarily uh, necessary to do a friendly amendment for that, but I think those are helpful uh, things for staff to hear um, if this motion passes that they can um, further discuss with the applicant. So I think I'd, the motion also, still covers um, that as well. I would also like to comment that I don't think we're going to have a big problem with the 23 foot setback. I don't, I can't say for sure, but that is not one of the issues which, which, which concerns me at this point. So that's just a comment as well. Agree with that too. Okay. I agree with that as well. Um, all right. We have a motion from Maureen and a second from John. We're going to go ahead and take a vote on this one and see where we land. Um, Mike. Yes. Amy. Yes. John. Yes. Brenda. Yes. Andreas. I will vote yes. And just to comment, I think it's a very nice project as well. But the um, things that were addressed uh, by Brenda and yourself as well, Madam Chair, I think those were very valid points. So, uh, yes. Okay. Thank you, Andreas. Andra. I'll vote no, and I want to explain briefly my thinking. I am right. concerned 
about forcing this to go back to the architect without some sign that we will accept the building length and the setback because it adds to the soft construction costs by kind of forcing the applicant to go back and forth. Uh, that's my reason for voting no. Okay. Maureen. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, that motion to table and send it back to um, the applicant to send back to the staff passes from six to one. And um, I think the the points brought up were pretty clear for staff of what the commission um, would like to better address in the next time we see this. All right, with that, um, it's been two hours. Let's take a five minute break and reconvene at 736. Okay, well, we need, we need Brenda for our quorum. So at least we'll pay for one of those. Check one more time, Andreas, are you back? Uh, yes, I am back. Okay, thank you. All right, we've thank got you. everybody back in attendance. Let's go ahead and uh, reconvene the meeting. Uh, moving on to the next agenda item, it is River's Edge at Redwood Design Review and Plan Development at approximately 750 North Redwood Road. It's case number PLN PCM. 2021-00606 and PLN PCM 2021-00702 and the planner is David. Okay, good evening, Madam Chair. I'm going to sh share my screen presentation. All right, you should be seeing a presentation now. So yep. this is the River's Edge at Redwood Road Design Review and Plan Development, as you noted, with the application numbers. Um, the project request, it's a proposed multifamily residential development with 82 units housed in 12 individual buildings. Uh, this would be located on a 2.27 acre parcel that's currently vacant at 750 North Redwood. The zoning is CB or community business. Design review is required due to the buildings exceeding the total, total building size limits of the CB zone, which allows for a 7,500 square foot footprint or 15,000 square feet overall. This with the number of buildings exceeds that, so it has to go through the design review process. And plan development is required due to buildings that don't have public street frontage. Um, since this is in the CB zoning district, these are essentially townhome units. Attached, attached single family type units are not allowed in CB. However, this will be platted as a condominium development uh, with ownership of the individual units, whereas the property will be held in common. So that is allowed as a multifamily development in the CB zoning district. So again, it will be platted as a condominium development and staff is recommending approval of both applications with conditions. Take you through the site layout. Um, again, I noted it's a 2.27 acre site it's an interior property just um, north of 700 north on the east side of Redwood. It'll have a single driveway coming in in about the approximate center of the property that goes to this kind of T, the darker drive or the main drive, and then there'll be individual access drives between the different rows of units. Um, also note the there is some surface parking and there will be parking in each of the garages for the individual units. Site context, uh, the property is zone CB and it abuts property to the south that is zone CB uh, all along 700 
uh, north. A number of those properties were rezoned from R1 5000 to CB in the last, I would say, three years. There were a couple different applications for a variety of properties in this area to be rezoned to CB. This particular lot, uh, again, is vacant. It did have commercial uses at one time. It's been vacant for quite a number of years. And looking through city files, it's kind of been a little bit of a code enforcement problem child uh, with dumping and camping and all sorts of other things going on. So uh, high weeds, things like that. Um, it's surrounded by R15000 zoning on Irving Street and Ivy Circle. Um, but to be honest, the property immediately to the north is a condominium development about three stories tall. And most of the developments on Ivy Circle and Irving Street are all small scale residential uses, typically fourplexes. So the zoning pattern doesn't match the zoning. So the, 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 sorry, the development pattern doesn't match the underlying zoning. So it is in an area of largely multifamily uses. Uh, again, a little bit of a aerial view looking to the west of the subject property. On the south boundary is a gas station property. And then again, these are the properties on Irving and Ivy that have largely been developed for small scale residential multifamily uses. Standards of the re of review, we looked at the base zoning standards for the CB uh, business zoning district. Uh, the design standards in Chapter 21A37, as well as the standards for plan developments and standards for design review. Um, we'll note that a couple things, uh, the parking for the property is one space per unit. That's the requirement in the CB district. And one space will be provided per unit within the uh, enclosed garage at each unit. And they're also providing a extra 14 surface parking spaces for guests and other parking. As far as buffering goes, and I'll go back to the site plan for a moment, um, the requirements, since it's an interior, uh, interior lot, they do not have an interior side yard requirement on either the north or south uh, property lines. However, they are, in, they are providing a seven foot interior side yard, which is beyond what's required and landscaping both of those. And then the rear yard, which would be on the east side of the development. There's a 10 foot rear yard requirement with a seven foot landscaping buffer and they are meeting that. They're also providing a six foot fence around the site for some additional buffering. Uh, the proposed development is supported by city plans and policies, and it will not be incompatible with adjacent development. It complies with the base zoning standards, the general design standards, the standards for design review, and those for a plan development. So st such staff is recommending uh, that, or finds that the proposal meets the applicable design review and plan development standards and recommends the planning commission approve both requests subject to the following conditions, uh, the final approval of si any si site signage, lighting, landscaping, tree street trees will be verified during the building permit review and a condominium plat must be finalized and recorded for this development. They have submitted that application, but that's a staff level review. I can answer any questions you might have. Okay, thanks, David. Um, commissioners, any questions for staff at this time? So I'm looking at the uh, I'm looking at the layout on page three of the staff report um, that shows that T um, that you talked about. I'm just trying to um, get a sense of like what's the distance between the units? Is it so when you have the parking, is there any sort of a little driveway or is the garage right up to the um, to the road, you know, the access drive? I believe it is right up to, but I'll let the applicant address that more specifically. I was just trying to see if I could 
sometimes when I enlarge the the fine print of the how how you know the distance doesn't come into focus. So how what is the width of those building access drives? Um, let me see if I can see it on an enlarged plan. I do understand your concern that. Oh, here it's below, but I can't read it. 20 something, something. TYP. I can't, I can't make it out. Um, okay. I stopped sharing so I can enlarge my screen without, it's about 24 feet. 24 feet. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? Okay, um, let's go to the applicant, um, Jared Hall. Has he been moved into the, yeah, there he is. All right, Mr. Hall, are you there? Yeah, I should be here. Okay, do you um ha do you need screen sharing privileges? Um, I think presentation? David did a wonderful presentation, so I probably don't need to reiterate the things he's had. Um, I did okay, want to point ahead. out that yes, we are providing additional buffering on the sides from what is required to try and help be a good neighbor. And point out that any one of our individual buildings meets the size requirement of the zone. It's just we have multiple of them, so we go over the size requirement of the zone. And then I'm here for any questions you have. Okay. Commissioners, any questions for the applicant? All right. Um, with that, I will open the public hearing. Um, and uh, I don't see any hands raised, but there are no hands raised at this time. And let me just check the email and no emails received. Okay. Well. And uh, all right, with that, I will close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission. If you have questions, discussion, or a motion. I would note one thing. It was sent to the community councils for the area, and this is I've had a number of rezones in this area. It actually falls within 600 feet of four different community council areas, and we didn't get any comments from either uh, Rose Park, Jordan Meadows, West Point, or Fair Park on this. No, you didn't. Okay. Anybody ready to make a motion? I'll make a motion. Okay, go ahead, Andrew. Um, based on the findings and analysis in the staff report, testimony and discussion at the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission vote to approve the proposed design review and plan development applications for the River's Edge at Redwood Townhomes located at 715 North Redwood Road, files PLN PCM 2021-00606 and PLN PCM 2021-00702 with the conditions of approval listed in the staff report, uh, specifically final approval of the details for site signage, lighting, landscaping, and street trees will be delegated to staff for verification during the building permit review. And two, a condominium, condominium plat must be finalized and recorded for this development. I'll second. Okay, I have a motion by Andra and a second from Mike. Let's go ahead and take a vote. Um, let's start with Maureen. Yes. Okay, John. Yes. Andreas. I will vote yes. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, Amy. Yes. Brenda. Oh, I'm not hearing you, Brenda. Have we lost you? Looks like we will come back and see if her video comes back up. Mike. Yes, Brenda. Yes. Uh, there you are, Brenda. Yes, uh, your vote. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Okay. I've been. Yeah. No, no problem. Andrea. Yes. Okay. With that, the motion passes unanimously, and you are good to go, Jared. All right, next up on our agenda is a zoning map amendment at approximately 1330 South, 700 West. It is case number PLN PCM 2021-00257, and the planner is Eric on this one tonight. Hi, good evening, commissioners. Nice to be with you. 
And so this is a zoning map amendment request. And let me, oops, share here. Okay, did that pull up all right? No, I don't see anything. Ah, uh, here it's coming. Right. I still don't see anything. There we go. There. You're up and running. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, this is a request to rezone just a single uh, parcel at um, that is currently zoned R17000 and it includes the seldom used or seldom seen transitional overlay. Um, but they're requesting that that would may, remain in place. So you can see the property here outlined in yellow with the transitional overlay uh, with the black dash lines. It's uh, just under 0.8 acres. There's currently a, a single family home on it and a, a large workshop to the rear property. Um, there's no specific proposal for the redevelopment of the property at, at this point but the intent is that it would um, be redeveloped for future either multifamily or mixed use development. And staff is re recommending the planning commission for a positive recommendation to the city council. So taking a look at the vicinity, just to kind of give a little better feel. So this is a subject property here off 700 West with the large Napa auto across the street. You can see there's, um, to the north is kind of the single family neighborhood that's fairly well established. And then um, to the south is largely light industrial, a lot of outdoor storage and whatnot. Um, and then there is some PL land uh, to the rear of the property. So this is in the top left hand corner is the subject property with the single family home and the storage uh, sheds to the rear and then uh, circling around looking kind of northwest this is one of the single family homes uh, to the northwest uh, the napa auto across the street and then this is um, taken from the other street looking at the side of the property but one of the light industrial with the uh, parking lot there that's um, quite well kept so in in looking at this there's a number of considerations to examine first is of course the master plan for the area it falls under the west side master plan um, and really there's quite a few statements that have been included in your staff report um, specifically about the future vision for the 700 west corridor to gradually uh, diversify and add more options for commercial and multifamily residential and um, although some of that can be accomplished with the transitional overlay it doesn't um, meet the full intent as as written in that master plan. So this rezone would help uh, realize uh, the uh, vision in the master plan further. And then looking through plan Salt Lake, there are numerous initiatives that this would help implement in the uh, areas of neighborhoods, growth, housing, transportation and mobility, air quality and economy. Um, those are explained further in your staff report, but essentially by kind of providing a better buffer and transition, it, it would help stabilize the existing residential areas, increase housing, and um, also, you know, be a more appropriate transition to the light manufacturing to the south. Uh, the neighborhood is convenient to mass transit. Of course, there's employment opportunities and there's quite a few neighborhood amenities. So it um, is supported very well by the master plans of the city. Some additional considerations would be to consider uh, that buffer, you know, would the new CB zone be an appropriate buffer? Um, so it does, the CB zone has a lot of compatibility with the R17000. Um, so for example, you know, R17000 has a 28 foot height limit and the CB zone has a 30 foot. Um, of course, R17000 on one side has a seven foot buffer and this would include a seven foot landscape buffer adjacent to residential. So in, in that sense, it would um, help protect that neighborhood. 
And then of course it would introduce uses that are more compatible with the single family residential. Um, and, you know, the CB zone doesn't allow for like a light manufacturing and the outdoor storage and that that can that can have the impact on the single family residential. So we do staff does feel it's an appropriate buffer. Um, that transitional overlay, um, I kind of did an outline in your staff report, but um, just because it's seldom used, it does have provisions that the biggest thing is, is it lists some additional uses and um, allows them to uh, be approved under a modified conditional use pro process that kind of incorporates a few more standards and, and checks for nuisances a little bit more. But the, the biggest problem is it, you know, it does still allow for that light manufacturing and it does not allow housing. So um, in and of itself, it's maybe not the best uh, transition to the single family residential. Um, and then also, because the CB zone allows for uses that are non-residential, uh, the applicant has had to submit a housing loss mitigation plan, and that has been reviewed and approved. However, they still do need to select officially, you know, if if a house, if the house is to be torn down at some point, they would need to um, choose one of the options for replacement housing. Um, that would likely just be under a development agreement. Um, that will be need to be in place prior to the uh, public hearing from city council. But I just wanted to make you aware that that is in the works and that would be an acceptable uh, term under the ordinance. So yeah, just, I won't read these, but of course we have our standards for zoning map amendments and this uh, seems to fall uh, within all of those and accomplish each of those goals. And um, so again, staff is recommending uh, that the Planning Commission forward a, a recommendation of approval to the City Council with the condition that the property owner enters into an agreement to construct at least one replacement dwelling unit in accordance with the uh, options for housing uh, mitigation loss. Okay, thanks Eric. Questions? Uh, I'd be happy to take them now. I have a quick question on your land use comparison. Sure. Um, I, I mean, I made up what I think the C and the P means, but I want you to tell me because I couldn't find a key to really know what you meant. Okay. Then, so, yeah. confirm or deny what I think. Okay. So, what was the, what does the P mean and what does the C mean in your land use comparison table? Um, yeah, so if it's whether it's conditional or permitted under that zone. Ah, I didn't think I might permit it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So the transitional overlay introduces a number of other land uses that become yeah. conditional. And so. Yeah, and you brought that up like they might not be the best um, transition to the single to the residential on the on, on the one side. Um, right. But they're all conditional uses, but conditional uses are. We don't rarely we don't get to really say no to them. We don't right. have to be able to modify whatever type of a impact they would make. Right. So and I transitional think that, overlay does add a few additional standards. That's why I kind of call that a modified conditional use process. Mm -hmm. So it does do a better job and and implements a few additional tools to mitigate um, those type of uses. But I think it's. It's a step, but it's not all the way there. Okay. Why are we going to leave this um, transitional overlays? I'm considering, I've never seen this before. It's really, there's not many properties that fall in this. Why do we want to leave it? Especially if it allows some, some uses that probably aren't what we want to see um, as a good transition buffer to those residential unit uh, buildings next door. Um, the applicants can speak to that a little bit as well, but it seems to, in my conversations with them, that um, it does open up a few more options. 
and if the market is not there and not looking favorable for multifamily or for something like that, it does give a few more options. Um, and again, they they are good. The additional standards are good. They're just not as good as would be under the CB zone. Okay, so we need to really look at what those additional options are and see if we feel like they're appropriate. Okay, any other questions from the commissioners to staff? All right, uh, let me open up this document. Is the applicant here? It is uh, Marco and Melinda. Geronimo? Here. Oh, there we go. Hello, are you, you look Hello. like you're uh, muted. Are you here? Yes. Uh, can you guys hear us? There we are. Yes. Okay. Um, yes. Do you have a presentation that you need uh, to share the screen with, or were you just going to uh, give a no. little? Yeah, no. Okay. We don't, um, I think what Eric already presented is. Uh, Okay. If you would just state both of your names for the record so that I you know it was pronounced um, correctly, then the floor is yours. Um, sure. My name is Marco Geronimo, and this is my wife, Melinda. Hello. So we are the ones uh, that are trying to get permission for this rezoning. Um, I think what Eric already presented, uh, it's well, plenty it's good. Nice. Yeah. So we do appreciate your time. Uh, all we All we can say is that uh, we've been in this neighborhood for quite a while, so we're very vested as well to see it uh, progressing and improving. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, commissioners, any questions for the Geronimos? So I have um, kind of a follow-up question to what I was just talking to Eric about. Um, and uh, Eric, you might have to pipe in on this. So if you chose to use <laughs> Um, the the um, uses that are allowed in the transitional overlay, but are not allowed in the um, CV zone. None of those have a housing component, and yet you um, will be having to at least replace one dwelling unit. Eric, is there a requirement for location by which that is replaced um, in the vicinity, or is it just anywhere in the city on other property they may own? So there are several options for housing loss mitigation. I don't have them in front of me right okay. at the moment. So maybe you can look they, at that. And can, for example, they can even do a monetary amount for the cost of that unit, or it could be put in another place. I do know those two. Um, I don't okay. have the specifics right in front of me, though. Okay. So, so yeah. just your. Um, we are talking about uh, replacing the unit uh, as we develop uh, this area, correct? Um, so our intent is basically to build uh, dwelling apartments, uh, mix business over there, uh, but main, mainly just apartments. So that should mitigate uh, losing that unit over there. Yeah, so I guess I'm just curious why you want to keep this transitional overlay um, and what you're not requesting to just like, you know, eradicate that and rezone it completely to Z to CV. When when we had uh, talked about that with Eric, there were some differences and setbacks and stuff that some smaller details that we thought. Um, and since the tr the um, the zoning amendment didn't require us to let go of the transitional overlay that there didn't seem to be a reason to do so uh for the plans that we had and just allowed uh for for those additional options with some setbacks if we needed to utilize those okay i think i'm i'm a little i don't want to say totally concerned but i'm a little concerned about those those uses that are allowed in the transitional overlay um, not really being something we would want to see happen here, that it would be cleaner if we did away with that and you had the options to do whatever you wanted. But I'm going to think that through as we go forward. Um, anyway, I just was curious as like why your reasoning is why you wanted to keep it. So that's helpful. Um, commissioners, any other questions for the applicant at this time? 
Okay. I'm going to have you guys stick around. We'll do the public uh, comment portion and then come back to the commission. And if we have any um, further questions, we'll, we'll ask you. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks everyone. I do not see any hands, Kelsey. That's correct. There are no hands up at this. And, um, this had no public comments in the staff report. Did we get any um, emails, John? There were no emails. Okay. Then I will close the public comment period and bring it back to the commissioners um, for a discussion, further questions or a motion. I can make a motion. Go ahead, Mike. Based on the findings listed in the staff report, the information presented and the input received during the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission forward a recommendation to the City Council to approve the request to rezone the property located at 1330 South 700 West from R1 7000 to CB for petition PLN PCM 2021-00257 subject to complying with the following condition listed in the staff report. One, the property owner enters into an agreement to construct at least one replacement dwelling unit in accordance with the Salt Lake City Code Section 18.97.03 0.a options for mitigating residential loss replacement housing. Second. Was that Andra? Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I, this is Amy. Can I, um, can I make an amendment that we remove the transitional overlay? You can make that suggestion. I have a motion from Mike and a second from Andra. Um, Amy's making a suggestion for a friendly amendment. I'm taking it um, to Mike, and that's his choice. And commissioners, if I could, I, I do know that some of these uses are kind of light industrial uses, but I think if you look in the context of Seventh West, I think that although they may not be appropriate in most areas, um, that you may want to just kind of take a look at and, and kind of make a decision as to whether or not you think they're appropriate. I'm going to defer to staff's judgment and go ahead with the original motion. Okay, so that um, friendly amendment was rejected. Um, Amy, you would have, uh, well, depending on how this goes, then you could make an alternate motion. Well, let's go ahead and uh, take a vote, Maureen. Yes. John? Yes. Brenda? Yes. Mike? Yes. Amy? Yes. Andrea? Yes. And Andreas? I will vote yes. Okay, that motion passes unanimously. You are um, good to go. And thank you for coming tonight. Uh, let's move on to our last agenda item. Thank you. Is, Thanks. Thank you. That is the airport influence overlay zone map amendment. It's case number PLN. PCM 2021-00915, and I don't know who is presenting this. It's not written on my cheat sheet. So. I'm, I'm presenting it to uh, Chrissy Gilmore. <laughs> All right, Chrissy. So you should be able to see my screen. Yep, you're good. So this is a request initiated by the mayor to amend the zoning map to remove the property at 2300 uh, 2333 West North Temple from the airport flight path protection influence zone A. The property is currently occupied by a commercial building, which is the airport in. The result would allow the airport in to accommodate stays greater than 30 days as transitional housing. The zoning code does not include a land use that directly matches this kind of supportive housing. Under city code, rooms that are available for rental or lease for periods of less than 30 days are considered a hotel or motel, um, while dwellings that are rented for periods of longer than one month generally fall into the residential land use category and would be prohibited um, in the transitional, I mean, in the airport influence zone A. So I've included this map that shows the boundary um, of the current airport influence zone A, and then the proposed boundary, which is essentially just that one parcel, the airport in. Staff is recommending the commission forward a positive recommendation to the city council regarding this request. 
So as far as key considerations, if, re if removed from the influence zone, the property would still be subject to all the zoning regulations of the base zone, which is the TSA um, mixed employment center core zone. The primary impact is that the uses currently prohibited under the overlay zone would now be allowed if they are permitted or conditional uses in the TSA zone. These include multifamily residential um, and some institutional uses that are prohibited in the overlay zone. I've bolded those the main impacts on the screen. So it's these residential uses. Um, single family detached is not permitted in the TSA zone. And then institutional uses such as schools, hospitals, churches, and rest homes would be allowed with this amendment. Um, it would also remove sound attenuation requirements, which is a suggested condition of approval to add that as, in as a requirement for a development agreement. Um, and then as far as the compatibility of neighborhood pro neighboring properties, the surrounding properties, you can see to the north is the airport and then to the east, east and I mean the west and south is primarily parking like car rental parking and the parking spot. And then to the east is a large corporate um, building. So as far as standards of review, when, analy when and, um, analyzing the project, we consider the standards of re review. Uh, those are consistency with city plans and policies, supporting purpose of the zoning ordinance, extent of impact on adjacent properties, consistency with any overlay districts and adequacy of public facilities and services. Staff believes that the proposal meets those standards. The full analysis is, analysis is in attachment E of your staff report. And then these are photos of the site. So this top left photo is the existing airport in that is currently being remodeled to um, accommodate this transitional housing if approved. Then the top right is the property to the west, which is a car rental shop. Um, and then below is the top, the bottom left is the head, uh, headquarter office building. And then across the street is airport, which you can see. So the recommendations. So as far as public engagement, staff receives two comments from the same individual concerned about the proposal. Um, the, the proposal is technically in two community council boundaries. Um, I did not hear from either one of them, but the West Point Community Council, which is outside of the boundaries, did submit comments. Um, with general concern that this would set a precedence for similar rezones. Um, and those comments are available in your staff report. But in conclusion, staff is re recommending that the Planning Commission forward a positive recommendation to the City Council with the one condition that I mentioned. Um, a development agreement shall be recorded on the property that requires any new development or substantial remodel of existing development to be constructed with air circulation systems of at least 30 dBs of sound attenuation in sleeping areas and at least 25 dBs of sound attenuation elsewhere to help mitigate that impact of longer term residential stays. And with that, that concludes my presentation. I'm available for any questions. Okay, thank you. Chrissy, any questions from commissioners at this point? Yeah, uh, Chrissy, so so what what this does is allow um, what you're actually doing is allowing a longer term residential use, which would normally not be allowed at all, but you still are requiring the, the sound attenuation. Yeah, that's correct. So with the re with the condition of approval, it would still require that sound um, protection, but it would just allow stays longer than 30 days. Right. OK, thank you very much. Okay, um, uh, since this originated from the mayor's office, there is no applicant. Um, was I saw somebody? Well, no, never mind. Um, all right. So, with that, if there's any further discussion, I can have it now. Otherwise, I'm open for a motion. I, um, Commissioner Barry, you still need to open the public. Oh, comment. thank you. Yeah, I I forgot that. Um, we will open the public comment period, and uh, I don't see any hand raised of who is. Um, That's correct. There are no hands up at this time, and no emails received. Okay. Thank you for the reminder. Um, with that, I'll close the public comment period, bring it back, and uh, if anybody's ready to make a motion. I'm here. I can make a motion. Thank you, Brenda. Okay. Um, 
Based on the information in the staff report, the information presented and the input received during the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission forward a positive recommendation to the City Council to approve PLN PCM 2021-00915 with the following condition, a development agreement shall be recorded on the property that requires any new development or substantial remodel of existing development to be constructed with air circulation systems of at least 30 decibels of sound attenuation in sleeping areas and at least 25 decibels of sound attenuation elsewhere. Second. Ah. Okay, I have a motion from Brenda and a second from Andra. Let's go ahead and take a vote. Maureen? Yes. Andreas? I will vote yes. Mike? Yes. Amy? Yes. Andra? Yes. John? Yes. Brenda? Yes. Okay, that motion passes unanimously. Um, and with that uh, concludes our business tonight. Um, I wanna thank everybody again um, for participating in this extra meeting and know that I, we will see you on January 12th. And with that, happy holidays and happy new year. This meeting is adjourned. Happy holidays. Thank everybody. you everybody. Yeah, Merry Christmas.